wanted to, uh, okay. So I wanted to uh, talk today about uh, hypopharyngeal surgery for obstructive sleep apnea. And uh, there's a lot of material here because I combined about three lectures worth of material uh, just to give you an overview of uh, hypopharyngeal surgery. So, um, there. Okay, so objectives are to understand what options we have available for treatment of the hypopharyngeal obstruction and uh, where it fits into the uh, whole picture and overall approach. And then uh, may, maybe importantly, to provide a uh, novice approach, so for beginners. And because uh, this is where I started because I wasn't trained in my residency to do any of this stuff. So we're gonna look at uh, what surgical options uh, are available and very briefly, anatomy of upper airway obstruction as it pertains to what we're talking about and briefly on evaluation because we've covered that in depth before. And then uh, what surgical approach we have to the hypopharynx and other retrolingual procedures. So this is a list basically uh, covers most things that we do in the hypopharynx. Hyoid suspension is, is a major one. Lingual tonsillectomy also, maybe more so in kids. Uh, midline glossectomy, uh, radio frequency tongue reduction, and uh, tongue stabilization. And then there's genioglossus advancement and hypoglossal nerve stimulation, which will be the subject of a different lecture. So Michael Friedman, um, about 12 years ago, kind of uh, said that uh, maybe 25% of patients have problems that can be uh, uh, related primarily to palate and tonsils and treated successfully with a UPPP. Uh, but uh, over three-fourths of people have multi-level obstruction, which includes uh, tongue base obstruction. And the standard of care for OSA surgery uh, has been UPPP since its introduction in uh, 1981. Uh, but there was a problem with this, even though a lot of, uh, a lot of patients got better. Uh, overall, uh, they said that there were po poor results. And uh, the poor results means a 50% success rate overall uh, in uh, patients uh, where you suspected it was uh, palate surgery. So the problem uh, of having tongue base or base of tongue obstruction is extremely high with the morbidly obese or those with deficient mandibles or the very severe obstructive sleep apnea. It's, it's not always 100%, but the, uh, the chance goes up. And uh, Robert Riley, who uh, is of Stanford uh, University fame, said, if you think you can cure this patient with UPPP alone, you are probably wrong. And so that was many years ago. Still holds true. And uh, again, the correct uh, and accurate diagnosis is uh, of applied anatomy. So you've seen this slide before. And basically to emphasize, the tongue is large. The uh, retropalatal airway is uh, narrow. And so this is what we have to deal with. Th these are the structures, not so much the uh, tongue fat unless, or the chin fat, unless you have to cut through it, then sometimes that's an issue. But uh, fat is deposited in the tongue in three separate zones with the posterior zone uh, enlarging with uh, weight gain at a faster rate than the rest of the tongue. And uh, we see this in the red line with uh, weight gain, you see more mass put into the tongue base compared with the anterior tongue. And uh, you've seen this slide before. So we've got tongue base obstruction, goes up with the BMI. And so we'll look at exam. And uh, again, looking in the mouth, is the tongue at or above the occlusal plane? And we use the Friedman tongue position to uh, uh, record that. And then large tongue, uh, indentations uh, from the teeth uh, indicate that it's larger than what the jaw can hold. And then looking at tongue base um, airway, Morse classification will uh, show in a few minutes. And then looking at the voliculus, the space between the tongue base and the epiglottis, uh, always to record, you know, is it patent, is it decreased, is it, is it full? And then lingual tonsils comment on their size and uh, how they fill the volecula. And then the epiglottis, is it right up against the tongue base? Is it set back against the posterior 
uh, pharyngeal wall with a patent follicular, or is it just leaning back or tilted back, kind of an oblique uh, position? And then uh, fiber optic endoscopy, generally performed upright and supine, but if you have a patient uh, where the obstruction is just uh, intense on sitting position, I, I don't proceed with a supine view. And then um, you're assessing both behind the soft palate and behind the tongue. Passive endoscopy should pretty much look at end expiration. That's generally when the airway is the smallest, so you just let the patient breathe. And then active uh, endoscopy with Mueller's maneuver. Um, when uh, you're not planning on a sleep endoscopy, that sometimes can be helpful to uh, tell you when a UPPP is not going to be successful because it, it looks at collapsibility of the airway. And again, the Mueller's is the opposite of the Valsalva. So you're holding the nose and having the patient inspire against a closed uh, airway. So success rate as far as uh, UPPP and Mueller's is, is, is kind of mixed. And uh, if you have lateral wall collapsing uh, medially, then UPPP is probably not going to fix that. And anybody who has a retrolingual obstruction, that pretty much predicts a UPPP failure. So basically, it'll tell you when a UPPP is not going to cure the patient. And as far as lateral pharyngeal wall collapse, uh, hyoid suspension actually can uh, stretch out uh, and make the lateral wall less uh, collapsible. Um, maxillomandibular advancement, of course, will do that. And then um, Tucker Woodson's uh, procedure of UPPP, the lateral expansion uh, sphincter pharyngoplasty, will uh, stretch the wall. And then his uh, transpalatal advancement pharyngoplasty will put some tension on the lateral wall as well. So when you're looking at lateral wall collapse, these are some of the things that you can do to uh, take care of that. And lateral wall collapse, of course, can happen in the oral pharynx and uh, somewhat in the hypopharynx. Now, you've seen this picture of cephalometrics, and uh, basically there's two things here to pay attention to. The uh, posterior airway space is the space behind the tongue, and the mandibular plane to hyoid, that's uh, pretty important also. Uh, and that's supposed to be a right angle, but it didn't come that way in this diagram between the H and the MP. And what we see here is what we need to pay attention with. And I, I told you previously, I used to obtain these from a dentist. We had an agreement that uh, he would charge his, uh, my patients less if I sent them to him because it was not covered by medical insurance for some reason, and they couldn't do it at hospital radiology. And then a posterior airway space less than six is going to give you obstruction down there. And mandibular to hyoid plane, uh, usually less than 20 or 21 will uh, Millman here in CHESS 2000 says less than 21. And then we have other papers at uh, Riley's papers early on said less than 20. So a hyoid that's low in the neck does poor with a UPPP. So ceph cephalometric uh, identifies those who will not do as well with a UPPP. Because for years, that was our operation. Now, sleep endoscopy will guide you as far as the sites of obstruction, structures involved, and the pattern of collapse. So with this, you form a surgical plan. Uh, Abdullah's paper generally shows there are generally more than one or two sites of obstruction in most people, and there are a lot of contributing uh, structures involved. So why do we treat the tongue? Because 50% uh, of uh, OSA patients have tongue-based obstruction in non-REM sleep and 80% have it in REM sleep. And uh, uh, Richard Lewis from Australia, I liked his approach, and I saw this at a hands-on uh, surgical course uh, for obstructive sleep apnea, so I just wanted to pass it on to you. He talked about categories of tongue, tongue obstruction, and macroglossia, big tongue, of course, and then the hypotonic tongue uh, falls back when a person assumes a supine position. Uh, then there's a retrodisplaced tongue where the tongue is just setting back there. It doesn't matter if they're sitting up. It's just taking up the airway, uh, like in one person that I saw today. And so the tongue may not look enlarged in an upright position, but then when you place them supine, and that's what I was talking about, if they're obstructed in a sitting position, for instance, that lower picture, 
if uh, they're obstructed in that regard while they're sitting, I don't put them in a supine position because it's not going to give me any more information. But uh, if it looks pretty open upright and I, I put them in supine and it uh, falls back, uh, that gives you information to point you in direction of certain procedures. Okay. Also, uh, cephalometrics, again, if you have a, a class two malocclusion with ret retronathia and uh, uh, the tongue, although it may not look enlarged, but perhaps this sets it back. And sometimes the tongue is normal, but the jaw is not. And so that'll be an oversized tongue for the jaw. So Richard Lewis says, if it's big, reduce it. If it's hypotonic, stabilize it. If it's posterior, move it forward. Sounds pretty simple. So if it's big, you can reduce it with radio frequency tongue reduction. And uh, then there's also midline poster glossectomy, where actually removing tongue tissue, and uh, that's evolved over several procedures, we'll probably not cover very, uh, very uh, more than briefly. And uh, hypotonic, a uh, genioglossus advancement, uh, almost need oral surgery training for that. I've not been so bold as to do this myself, and I had some questions as to how long it would uh, maintain, but it is an accepted procedure. And then of course, tongue suspension suture has been around. And then uh, if it's posterior, move it forward, can do that with genoglossus advancement as well as a hyoid suspension. So as far as anatomic classifications, of course, there's Friedman's original classification, I'm sorry, uh, Fujita's original classification, where he tried to find where his UPPP procedure would be effective. And this you would do on clinical exam either uh, by uh, having the patient sitting in the chair and opening the mouth, or even with a flexible exam to try to determine if the tongue base is involved. And uh, in 25%, he felt that it was just strictly palate. And uh, Katzentonis uh, also in his paper showed that supraglottic obstruction, uh, that is epiglottis, uh, occurred probably in 10% of the patients. So this is the... Uh, classic paper by Scheer, the meta-analysis that showed that uh, UPPP was only 41% uh, successful in unselected patients. And then in those you selected by Fujita classification, maybe 50% successful. And, and look back here, it's 5.2% successful if there's tongue base. So Friedman came up with a staging to show when to do a tongue procedure and uh, when UPPP will be successful combination of tonsil size and tongue position. So he found uh, stage three, a large tongue with small tonsils has an 8% UPPP success. He reduced the tongue with a radiofrequency tongue base obstruction uh, with uh, treatment and increased his stage three success to 44%. So that tells you something. And uh, RF tongue reduction is a very uh, minimally morbid procedure for the patient and probably takes you no more than uh, 15 minutes to uh, take care of. So as far as surgical approaches to obstructive sleep apnea, uh, no widely accepted standards, pretty much based on your experience, uh, your skills, your confidence. And Katzentonis from Washington University, St. Louis said, uh, keep it simple. So he, uh, uh, in his uh, surgical course, uh, said that uh, basically reduce it to four procedures for retropalatal obstruction and four procedures for retrolingual. Now, the four procedures for retrolingual include the RF tongue reduction, midline glossectomy, tongue suspension, or uh, genoglossus advancement, and hyoid suspension. So those, those are what we would do for retrolingual obstruction. Now, the, the midline glossectomy, that's evolved over time. It first came out with a midline laser glossectomy which uh, apparently did not have good success and was terribly painful for most people. And I don't think anybody does it anymore. Then there was a so-called smile procedure, a submucosal reduction of the tongue using a radio frequency uh, a wand by a coblation. Um, but you were doing things blind, even if you had uh, an endoscope in there. I was never so bold as to proceed with this. And I heard a few stories from talking to some of my colleagues across the country when they would run into the lingual artery and uh, that was not fun. So Moore's classification, he uh, 
was an oral surgeon that uh, came up with tongue base obstruction classification where A, B, and C had the upper tongue base, upper and lower tongue base, and then uh, C involved the uh, epiglottis as well. And so what uh, Katzentonis said that if you have a more type A lingual tonsillectomy and uh, failure get tongue suspension, more type B, that is in an upright position by flexible, get a midline glossectomy and failures get tongue suspension. And more type C, hyoid suspension, because that also can bring the epiglottis forward, or a tongue suspension, and then failures get the RF reduction or genioglossus advancement. So these are kind of basic go-bys. Uh, he was teaching his residents at uh, uh, Washington University. So what about hyoid suspension? And this is the suspension bridge uh, over the uh, Colorado River in Grand Canyon. Uh, very interesting uh, hike. Um, back in uh, 2003, um, when I was, I'd been doing hyoid suspension probably for about five years at that point. I got this from the American Academy asking uh, uh, to fill out a questionnaire uh, to code for hyoid suspension. They were going to come up with a new CPT code. I could never find out how I got on their list, but apparently I was doing enough of them that somehow they found out. And um, uh, just uh, to pass this on to you, uh, when you do your first hyoid suspension uh, to larynx, uh, pick somebody that does not have a fat neck. Make it easy on yourself. Okay, history of hyoid uh, suspension uh, treatment started with uh, Patton in 1984, which was way long time ago. Uh, he did this in dogs and uh, uh, rather than trying to explain how he took the hyoid apart and tried to uh, move it forward, it just say uh, when they tried it in humans, it was unsuccessful. And here you see Fujita, Riley, and Powell uh, using it. Fujita, of course, up in uh, uh, Detroit area, Henry Ford Hospital. And then the hyoid suspension to mandible uh, with fascia lata. Now, that means going to the leg, removing uh, the, the fascia lata, and then closing up the thigh and then going to the neck and opening that up. Uh, we'll uh, show you this in a moment. Uh, instead of fascia lata, uh, Ramirez and Loeb in 1996 uh, went to Mersaline suture. But uh, coming to uh, back to Riley, um, when I graduated residency in uh, 1987, this was the only textbook there was on uh, obstructive sleep apnea surgery. And uh, from the chapter on other surgical procedures, uh, page 227, we had this description uh, by Riley. Uh, the body of the hyoid is encircled with fascia lata and wired to the newly positioned mandibular bone block. And so you had a, a sliding genioplasty. And so uh, going off on my own, which the Navy sent me to Guam, so I really was on my own, uh, I said, well, this is something I'll never do. And uh, just remembering that uh, Riley and Powell had a lot of uh, MD, DDS, oral surgeons in their department, so they could do this with uh, ease. Well, they revised the uh, hyoid uh, suspension instead of to the mandible, to the thyroid cartilage. And uh, then uh, what happened was a couple of companies, Repose and Airlift, came up with uh, revisited uh, positions to the mandible. Uh, I'll, sh I'll show you these in just a moment. Uh, I was interested in doing those, but it was just looked very cumbersome to me. And then, of course, hyoid, uh, the hyoid suspension to thyroid cartilage with a single wire technique. Uh, the, these folks are from Germany, and uh, they, they just had a little bit of different approach. They had some thyroid cartilage fractures, and then uh, somebody else proposed putting a uh, a uh, plate in like we use for the uh, bone fractures and uh, in order to prevent thyroid cartilage fracture. So uh, this was popular in Germany and in Europe, but we don't do that here. So uh, the conclusion uh, based on Vandergraaff said that the anterior displacement of the hyoid bone improves airway resistance in his study. And then Casey Lee, who is part of uh, uh, the Stanford uh, group and as you see, he's DDS oral surgeon. He said he found the technique to be less invasive than the mandible technique and comparable to earlier procedures. 
So indication for hyoid is tongue base prominence, as you saw, uh, tongue base collapse uh, with uh, sleep, such as uh, in supine position or during uh, sleep endoscopy, lateral wall collapse and uh, obstruction from the epiglottis uh, or AD folds. So uh, look at uh, this bone. It shows the middle constrictor uh, attachment. So when you're advancing the hyoid bone, you're actually stretching out the middle constrictor a bit. And so that's uh, where that will help. And on this picture, on the left, they're showing a hyoid suspension to the mandible. And again, they're showing the middle constrictor over on this side uh, being stretched out a bit. And uh, so there's a lot of uh, intimate relationship. And as you know, it's the only, only bone that's not connected to any other bone, but it has all these muscle attachments. So it anteriorly displaces the tongue base and pharyngeal dilators. And uh, with a suspension to the larynx, it brings hyoid down and forward, almost like a rotational procedure is the way KJ or uh, Casey Lee uh, talked, rather than a advancement like to the uh, mandible. And so there's an arc of rotation. And here, I took this from uh, Friedman's uh, text on snoring and sleep apnea. It shows the hyoid bone coming down and up, kind of a rotation. And again, uh, he said, uh, may improve some lateral wall collapse as well. And then, so how do we do it? Place a shoulder roll. Um, you know, sometimes the patient's neck doesn't bend like uh, last week we had that. And so we didn't use a shoulder roll. And um, so the incision, you make it directly over the hyoid, or you can put it into a uh, natural crease. Um, but sometimes if that's a little bit further than the hyoid, you have to make a larger incision uh, to get a good exposure. Dissect uh, with the bovi right down to the bone, and then do limited myotomy, both uh, inferior and superior. Just enough to advance it, because the goal is to keep the uh, muscles that count attached. And again, uh, avoid the superior laryngeal nerve, stay uh, uh, medial to the uh, lesser corner. So you identify the thyroid notch and limit exposure. Uh, Basically, you're dissecting soft tissue from the upper portion of thyroid cartilage, not the entire cartilage. Uh, clamp the uh, body of the hyoid. I use uh, an Alice uh, clamp for that and uh, mobilize it. So you can see when you can move it over the uh, uh, thyroid notch. And then with rigid fixation, cinch it down with sutures. And uh, you want to make sure it's very firmly cinched down because if there's any movement in the uh, in the complex that you've just created, the hyoid to the thyroid, patients will feel that when they turn their head and they don't like it. So uh, I would say uh, always drain this as a, new, as a novice surgeon. I've, I've come to not drain most of mine now. Uh, I've made smaller incisions overall. And then pressure dressing for four to five days. I usually keep it for two days, but if you're starting out, uh, just maybe a little bit longer and then use permanent sutures. Now, we've all used different kinds. Uh, Casey Lee used Tycron, uh, Tucker said Tevdec. Uh, I had neither of these available, so I used Proline when I started, and that's what I've continued to use. And then Mersaline by Ramirez and Loeb. So again, placement of the incision, uh, placing it directly over the hyoid bone gets you right there. Uh, people have uh, more adipose in their neck, a little bit harder to judge. That's why I say for your first ones, do people that don't have fat necks. And uh, if you're operating by yourself, you can put a self-retaining retractor in. Uh, right now with the residents, uh, either the resident or myself is uh, retracting with uh, Senrakes or Army Navies. And uh, limited myotomy. So you detach the uh, uh, strap muscles inferiorly and then uh, you know, detach the uh, digastric superiorly and limited uh, uh, myotomy otherwise because you want to bring everything forward. That's, that's the point. And so this is showing uh, some of the uh, 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 myotomy that you're doing. And then these are photos that I took during one of our surgeries showing the Alice on the uh, hyoid uh, uh, body superiorly and then uh, drawing the hyoid down over the uh, notch of the uh, thyroid. And the alices laterally there are just holding the strap muscles out of your way. I'm sorry, it's not a clearer picture, um, but we did the best we could at the time. And so I passed the uh, uh, sutures 
through the uh, thyroid cartilage superiorly, about a centimeter from the superior border. And the first two are placed medially. You can't go too medially because the thyroid cartilage gets real thick, medially, very medially. And then about a centimeter lateral to the medial sutures, I'll place the uh, lateral sutures. And uh, this shows the lateral sutures on the hyoid, just lateral to the uh, lesser cornea, but I go medial to the lesser cornea. And uh, only once uh, did I come across a, a guy that had an ossified uh, thyroid cartilage. I had to use a drill to drill through the cartilage to make, uh, to pass the sutures. Okay, so on the left side, uh, what you see is you see the four proline sutures placed through the thyroid cartilage, and that's the notch that's visible. And then in the picture on the right, the hyoid bone has been advanced over the notch of the uh, thyroid uh, cartilage. So this is supposed to be a video, so let's see if it works. It's a couple minutes long. So maybe we didn't do such a good uh, injection uh, beforehand, or maybe we were like general surgeons and a little bit too anxious uh, to make our incision. So two-pronged skin hook just to uh, allow for further dissection through the fat, uh, down to and through the platysma. You see the little mark on the thyroid notch we made. Okay, so now you're taking the uh, fingertip bovi and cutting through the uh, adipose there. And sometimes, especially in men, you'll come across uh, in anterior uh, cervical veins, and uh, you'll occasionally need to uh, uh, cross clamp and uh, tie those uh, suckers off. Sometimes they're very big. So you see the platysma laterally. Uh, you, uh, it was grasping with the, uh, uh, the forceps there. So what, what I like to do is I like to uh, find uh, the strap muscles and then divide them medially. And just widening our uh, lateral incision through the platysma a little bit more. So these videos were taken with a uh, 4 uh, or 4 millimeter nasal uh, endoscope. That's what we had. Okay, so now we're finding the uh, hyoid bone. So limited myotomy. Okay, laterally you have the strap muscles pulled lateral. Now we've got the mobilized uh, hyoid body and then you can see just inferior to that is the uh, top of the thyroid notch. That's the body. So adequate mobilization. And then sutures uh, pass through the uh, thyroid notch there, pointing to the hyoid body. And then uh, this shows the hyoid uh, advanced over the thyroid uh, cartilage. So you don't see the thyroid cartilage because uh, 
the hyoid body is is covering the thyroid notch. So, okay. So what are our limitations? Some people will say there's limited improvement of the lateral uh, wall collapse. Uh, yeah, sometimes that's that's an issue when they've got extensive collapse and difficult to accurately predict outcomes as with any of our uh, surgical procedures. And success rate is said to be inversely related to severity and inversely related to BMI. However, we just submitted a paper to laryngoscope that uh, shows in our patients that's different. Um, our median BMI was 35, and or in the other papers, it was always less than 35. So hopefully they'll take what we have here. So be careful in women that you don't yank on that thyroid body too hard because you can fracture the cartilage and then the game is over. And uh, you know it'll be like uh, removing the body of the thyroid uh, with our glossal duct cyst excision, but you can't uh, do anything to fix your sleep apnea. So loss of fixation, um, coming, sutures coming loose, or uh, you hear clicking, the patient hears clicking. Stroma, a big concern. I've had probably about a dozen patients in the past that uh, they developed a seroma because uh, they became active before they should. And uh, their, their, their uh, uh, message to me was, well, it didn't hurt. I said, well, that doesn't mean you should do more. And why didn't you call me? Well, it didn't hurt. Okay, well, fortunately, I haven't seen that uh, except once or twice in the last 10 years. And now dysphagia uh, usually resolves pretty quick. Uh, uh, it, it can take sometimes up to six weeks, though. So. That's my experience. Okay, so the hyoid suspension to the mandible is revisited with the Siesta Airlift, uh, which comes in a kit now. And uh, I heard Friedman speak probably about 10 years ago, and he uh, said that maybe in women this works better because they don't have as prominent a thyroid notch. And uh, so I began to try this uh, in the uh, women and now some men without a prominent thyroid uh, cartilage. And uh, Overall results are good, but uh, mixed. So decision of uh, uh, which uh, hyoid suspension to do is uh, based on surgeon's preference. Uh, patients here, it says with retro displacement of the epiglottis, uh, appear to have a higher success rate when including the hyoid suspension. And I think Adrian, you had a paper out uh, either last year or a year before on uh, uh, hyoid to mandible, is that right? Yep. And uh, uh, for, for some reason, I'll have to talk with, with you about this another time, but you eliminated uh, patients with tongue base obstruction and only included the epiglottis and you got uh, good results in those patients, uh, as I recall. Yep. So anyway, do you have anything to add at this point uh, to what we've said so far? No, I don't. So far, so good. <laughs> All right. Well, well let's uh, keep going. I hope I'm not going too, too fast. And so next procedure, midline posterior glossectomy. Okay, so uh, taken out of operative techniques, this shows uh, what would be the lingual arteries and the uh, uh, hypoglossal or hyoid branch of the lingual artery posteriorly. So incision is made midline and you can use a retraction suture, which I generally will use a 2 silk. And uh, you find the arteries with uh, an ultrasound and mark out where they are. And uh, generally, I will uh, begin just behind the pallidopharyngeus and then trace them forward, either me or the resident, and the other one marks with a surgical pen. And uh, so incision in the midline uh, done with uh, Bovi and then um, the coblation wand, I use an EVAC 70 primarily. I've tried the ProSize Max, but uh, I'm happy with EVAC 70. And then uh, this is how the tongue would look. This patient uh, is orally intubated, but we sometimes will intubate them uh, transnasally. So this is the uh, Doppler, uh, Fujita Doppler ultrasound where we're looking for the artery. You can see uh, just above uh, the placement uh, the uh, anterior uh, circumvallate papillae laterally, and you can see them on the other side as well. So generally the artery will co course just lateral to the uh, most anterior circumvallate. So if you stay within the V of the circumvallate, you're pretty safe. But I'm 
teaching the residents to go ahead and uh, mark this on both sides. Again, you can see the entire uh, circumvallate separating the anterior tongue from the posterior tongue. So here we're making the marks. Then I mark a midline uh, for the incision. So we inject uh, lidocaine with that be just for a hemostatic effect. Uh, pull the tongue forward. And uh, so you can depress the tongue sometimes to elevate the posterior aspects. And here showing the injection. And now making the cautery cut. And you can see the cut. Put, self, uh, put retaining sutures or uh, suspension sutures laterally. I uh, try to place them at the apex of the circumvallate because if you pr place them too anterior, sometimes you have to go ahead and place a second set of uh, retraction sutures more posteriorly. So then with the EVAC 70, start to uh, coblate the muscle tissue. And surprisingly, there's almost no bleeding from this procedure. A little further back uh, from the mucosa, primarily, you'll, you'll get some uh, oozing sometimes. And uh, then closing the incision with uh, Vicryl. I usually will put four Vicryl in, uh, sutures uh, anteriorly. I have started using 3-0 uh, sutures uh, uh, on everyone. Sometimes adults, I'll put some 2-0 sutures in just because I've had a couple dehiscences. And although they heal and do well, uh, once it dehisces, it hurts and takes twice as long to heal. So that's kind of the placement of the uh, Vicryl. You leave it open posteriorly to drain because if you sew everything closed and they have uh, drainage, it'll swell the tongue and that's an airway emergency. You don't want to see that. So that's uh, sutures in place. Okay. And what it looks like. Okay. This is a video of it. Uh, one of my residents was doing this a few years ago. So I was holding a uh, nasal endoscope while he was uh, doing the procedure. And uh, as you know, the coblation works underwater, so make sure you have enough water. And when I work laterally, I'll hold the uh, suture on that side more vertical, so I have better judgment of how far lateral to go. And uh, for my rule of thumb, uh, for the average patient, I'll uh, go probably uh, uh, two centimeters deep and uh, then uh, probably about uh, six to eight uh, millimeters lateral from that central uh, depression. But in some patients with really big tongues, I've, I've taken a finger's uh, worth out of their tongue and uh, they get uh, good improvement. So I also put these folks in step down. I give them uh, steroids, give them antibiotics. And uh, because we have a relatively closed oral uh, procedure, I'll use antibiotics. Lortab and Celebrex seem to work good. Sometimes ice gargles will be great as well. Uh, as with any OSA patient, watch the blood pressure on the first night. And uh, options, some, some people have recommended a nasopharyngeal airway overnight. I'll use nasopharyngeal airway on uh, extubation. Uh, just makes everybody happy as far as anesthesia, and then we're not uh, struggling through a palatal obstruction. And um, then once they're extubated in recovery and look like they're doing well, we'll just take out the uh, nasal airway. So what about lingual tonsils? Well, pick our coblation wand. And um, sometimes there's difficulty differentiating lingual tonsil from base of tongue. Uh, sometimes it's easy. And the definition of lingual tonsil hypertrophy is really not standardized. Uh, but it's critical because whether it's lingual tonsil or base of tongue, uh, you're using different procedures for these. And then, you know, if you don't identify correctly, uh, you can get decreased success, as Tucker Woodson has said in some of his palate lectures. So MRI certainly will uh, differentiate between them, but um, this is uh, not something that we do here. I know in Dallas and Cincinnati, they do uh, some kind of uh, uh, MRI uh, study along with flexible endoscopy. But uh, I think, personally, I think that's overkill. But they are leaders in their field, so I can't argue with them too much. Now, I thought these were great lingual tonsils. Look at the size of those suckers. They look almost like normal tonsils. And that's when I was in private practice. I took those pictures. So two approaches to lingual uh, tonsillectomy. Um, 
One is suspension laryngoscopy with the operating microscope. This is uh, prim my primary way. And then there's a way that's written about using a 70 degree sinus scope in the mouth. And uh, these folks are intubated uh, na nasally and they're pulling the tongue forward and a rubber bite block holding the mouth open and uh, retractors to soft palate, just like you're doing an adenoid. And I'll tell you, when I tried this, I just was not happy. It, the, the tongue was so big and couldn't get back there. And uh, so I would say, uh, if you want to, you can look into using that, but I like the suspension laryngoscopy approach. Coblation, I'll usually, for the adult, I'll set it on nine. Some people have been so bold as to go, I mean seven, and some people go higher. For children, especially young kids like three-year-olds, I'll start at a, at a five uh, or even a four just to uh, get a sense as to how hot the uh, coblator is. And uh, then I'll adjust uh, based on the response. And uh, ablate down to the muscle. If you go start to go into the muscle, then you start getting increased pain. If you leave just a little hint of uh, uh, lingual tonsil behind, some of these kids just, they don't hurt at all. And uh, adults, they always seem to hurt. And then avoid getting the epiglottis, it's right there. And uh, so if uh, you're uh, not too careful, you can do that. And just to note that uh, um, ArthroCare has made it uh, very well known that the FDA hasn't approved this for lingual tonsillectomy, although that's what everybody uses. So this is uh, a video we made some years ago, just shows Similar to the, uh, and this I think was a bilobed uh, lingual uh, tonsil. Um, very little bleeding with this procedure. Uh, if you'll get some oozing, it's usually up right near the tongue base where the lingual tonsil and the tongue uh, base meet, and you'll get some mucosal ooze, but it has a coag setting that you can easily take care of with that. So what I'll do is I'll put the coblator not through the endoscope, but alongside the endoscope. And you'll need to bend the tip a little bit, not a wide bend, but a bend right near the tip so that you get that upward uh, uh, pass with the uh, coblation wand. And uh, I uh, in, uh, tell the residents not to dig a hole, but just like when you're doing a mastoid, kind of saucerize. So give yourself wide exposure because down low in the vollecula, if uh, you're not careful, or sometimes even if you are careful, you'll hit the uh, um, ling the hyoid branch of the lingual artery, and uh, you can control it with the with the uh, coag setting, but it's not fun. Probably I've run into it four times, but it's not been in six or eight years. So you can also combine midline glossectomy with the coblation, and I find this to be easier because we've reduced the tongue already, and now you can depress it and actually see epiglottis, where as at the start of the tongue reduction procedure, depressing the uh, tongue base with a sweetheart retractor. Uh, it's hard to see the epiglottis in many of these kids uh, and adults as well. But if there's lingual tonsil there, uh, you can now get a lot of it fairly easy. And it's not ever going to be 100% uh, lingual tonsillectomy, but it's going to be significant. So here it shows uh, the process and then lingual tonsils are taken care of. So what about radiofrequency tongue reduction? Well, uh, th and this is San Diego, by the way. Um, that's something that Riley and Powell uh, came up with back in the late 90s. And so what uh, Riley said is that one day he was in the uh, operating uh, room or the locker room, and he saw one of his uh, cardiac uh, buddies, and he said, what you doing today? He says, I'm ablating the uh, heart conduction system. And he said, what? And uh, so we got some more information. So then they started out with uh, pig studies, pig tongue studies. And uh, what happened is the turbinate reduction, the pallet reduction came out first and the tongue reduction, which is what they were trying to do with this uh, was the final thing that was FDA approved. And uh, so let me play this. I think it has some sound actually. I got it from the, uh, art, from the gyrus uh, people. Four to 
So what they showed basically is you could get a 17% reduction in tongue mass, volumetric reduction. And uh, initially, uh, they, they said uh, do it in the office, then admit for observation overnight. But then they said you didn't need to do that. And uh, I did that on probably uh, um, a dozen patients. And it was just kind of a pain in the neck to do it under local anesthesia. So I just started combining it with uh, uh, the uh, UPPP that Friedman later showed was an advantage. You know, maybe I should have done some study back then, but uh, I was an academic. So two treatment approaches, performing it alone, which um, some people are now doing in, in uh, uh, boutique practices for, for snoring. And uh, there is sometimes snoring from uh, tongue-based reduction. And uh, you can perform it with other base of tongue procedures, which I've done with hyoid uh, as well. And then, as I said, Friedman combined it with U triple P. And then it's a, uh, Gyrus was the first one to come out. Now there's Arthrocare with the coblation, which is what we use uh, in our hospital. But Gyrus had a 22 gauge uh, needle that was uh, actually, they had single probe then, then they came out with a twin, twin probe. And um, we did a number of sites. I'll show you a little uh, map here that they provided. And uh, you, you set the, uh, a machine at 600 joules, which is an energy measure measurement, so 600 per probe, and repeated it every four to six weeks for two to three treatments. Um, anyway, uh, so they had this map, and I put this into the chart and show which ones I treated, and uh, they show five, six treatments there. Well, they, they never went too much beyond the third one. And this is the ArthroCare's uh, Reflex 45 one, which we use now. And I usually uh, do probably eight to 12 treatments, is however we can uh, get them into the tongue base. Usually starting at the uh, apex, uh, I'm sorry, at the uh, anterior extent of the uh, uh, circumvallate, maybe just a little bit anterior to that, and proceeding just uh, alongside of the midline, maybe a centimeter apart from each other, and then a centimeter back as far as we could go. And at the back of the tongue, we'll, we'll put a sweetheart retractor and press it down so that uh, we can get into the tongue without hitting the uh, posterior pharyngeal wall. And so superficial ulceration. I used to see that with the original gyrus on occasion. It would hurt them like an abscess ulcer. Tongue abscess. I never saw a tongue abscess. I saw a sterile abscess once. It didn't hurt. just had a little swelling uh, midline in the back. We got a CT, and it just drain spontaneously within a day or two. And then uh, upper airway obstruction. I never have seen this, have glossy and nerve injury. I've never seen that either, but those are possibilities. Now, what about tongue suspension suture? Well, some early systems uh, we, I just touched on briefly had the uh, air, van, air vans and the repose uh, systems. And they approached the uh, tongue uh, suspension a little differently. So with the repose, they went intra, intra orally, and uh, it just looked uh, a little bit rough to do. You know, I saw them at the uh, courses, and then you'd pass the suture out of the back of the tongue. You have to grasp it uh, physically, and uh, then you attach it to the uh, suture, and you have to then uh, pass a large needle uh, from one side to the other through the tongue base, and uh, that's how you got the sutures passed from uh, the right to left side of the tongue. And that's how it would end up looking. So with air vans, they did things a little differently. They went underneath the mandible and then passed the suture. So now Encore uh, has the uh, system by Siesta Medical, which actually uh, keeps the tongue from falling back. You're not so much pulling it forward as you're keeping it from falling back. Although sometimes you can pull it forward, it's just they're going to uh, have a little bit of uh, difficulty speaking and swallowing. Uh, I've had to uh, early on had to loosen up uh, uh, one of these. So this is the video from the uh, uh, company. 
I don't do as many of these as I uh, do the hyoid suspensions because I'm looking for glossoptosis, that is uh, hypotonic tongue, the tongue falling back. So where does this hypopharyngeal surgery fit in? Well, as you know, some patients are better suited for CPAP, uh, such as mor morbid obesity, although I'm finding in West Virginia, I'm operating on these people, and some are better suited for surgery. So basically, morbid obesity, they're the fa CPAP failures, and uh, I tell them, you know, what I'm trying to do is make it easier for you to use CPAP, because a lot of times they have a hy hypoventilation syndrome, and the treatment for that is uh, either bariatric surgery or CPAP. So as Riley said in clinics of 22 years ago, the extent of surgery is mediated by the patient's acceptance, severity of symptoms, severity of objective obstruction, level of airway collapse, and severity of site of obstruction. That's a lot in one sentence. So uh, the Stanford protocol, which I'm not sure if they still use this, um, but phase one, basically they did everything at once. Uh, it's, uh, Separating nasal surgery out, they did the whole upper airway. UPPP with either genioglossus advancement, hyoid suspension, basic tongue reduction, they just threw everything at the patient. And I think the patient was in the hospital for five or six days. And then phase two would be a, a reevaluation with a, a PSG at uh, four to six months. And if they failed, then they got maxillomandibular uh, osteotomies. So, uh, what Riley said is sometimes the hyoid suspension is preferred over the genioglossus advancement, and uh, he used the hyoid suspension in most of his phase one reconstructions. And um, then he says hyoid suspension is generally reserved for mild residual disease after initial airway reconstruction. So, you know, they played around with things a little bit. And again, it's, it's based on your experience, what you were taught, uh, how confident you feel. He treats nasal obstruction six to eight weeks after surgery, although uh, um, was it uh, Fairbanks who wrote that initial textbook said that maybe you want to treat nasal obstruction first because it's not that painful, but if you treat the uh, palate first, it's so painful they don't want any more surgery. Well, I think that was maybe true earlier on, but uh, I have combined it with a UPPP on occasion. Um, always using uh, nasal splints, which they can breathe through. So they, they basically come out of surgery with a better nasal airway. And, uh, but it seems the combination is really morbid. It's either one alone does not seem that bad. Like if you're doing a hyoid suspension and a septoplasty, either one alone is not that bad. But putting them together, it uh, really, it's not two plus two, it's like three times three. And uh, so I tried to separate those. So, although this is site-directed surgery, and we identify the anatomic abnormalities, applying this involves an art of medicine, and that's going to be supported by science, which, we, which is what we're talking about. But there's conflicting opinions. You saw some of that, and ultimately, it comes down to you, your experience, uh, your skill, your patient, and uh, how you want to approach it. So, I would say consider hyoid suspension. Uh, don't pick an obese patient. A uh, lingual tonsillectomy, of course, should not be that hard. Dr. Carr knows how to do these real easily. She'll show you if she hasn't already. RF tongue reductions. And then perhaps a uh, midline glossectomy and uh, tongue suspension suture. So that concludes tonight's uh, lecture. Uh, does anybody have any questions on anything? What's your um, opinion about doing a tongue suspension and the hyoid suspension at the same time? I, ha I have done that on a number of patients. And uh, uh, what I try to do is look for a uh, glossoptosis, that is the tongue falling back either uh, with a wake supine or with sleep endoscopy. Because I always do an awake sleep endoscopy, awake endoscopy first, and then uh, use the propofol. And if the tongue falls back, I'll consider a tongue suspension then. So I've combined them in a number of patients. Um, the, the morbidity is just a little bit more. Um, I'm not, I've not totally convinced myself this is the way I'd like to go, although a lot of people will do both every time. I find we I've done a couple with one of our attendings, and I find that the post-op like care is just really tough. The patients end up 
staying in the hospital a couple days just because pain control and they can't take PO and how do you guys deal with like the post-op care when you do both? Well, they, uh, like you said, often stay in for two days. Most of my sleep apnea patients are overnight, but uh, with tongue suspension, it seems to give them a little bit more morbidity. Uh, plus, uh, it, you know, I, th I think it's really a judgment call as to how far to uh, uh, pull those uh, suspension sutures forward. Um, I've had some people say that they feel like their tongue is pushing up against the front teeth now, and uh, they don't like that so much. Uh, but if you give it time, that gets a little better um, because I think the, the suture passes through some of the uh, uh, muscle tissue uh, in the back. But uh, yeah, it hurts. And um, what I've found early on is that if you have to make more than one pass to make that uh, suture catch, uh, then you're going to have a little bit more tongue swelling and uh, more, more pain. Because it doesn't doesn't always catch on the first uh, first pass. And that's my experience. Thank you. Yeah, a lot of a lot of steroid, a lot of ice, elevate head of bed, and uh, you know just tell encourage them that it's going to get better. Good questions. Anything else? Okay. Well, I think that should do it for tonight and uh, hope this helps you a lot. And uh, I guess we've got one more coming up in a, in a few weeks and uh, I'll, I'll talk with, uh, with Adrian about that. All right. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you. All righty.